This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Voltoro, the gold to Bitcoin exchange. Trade gold to Bitcoin instantly and securely, starting at just one milligram. Go to Voltoro.com to deposit some Bitcoin and start trading today. And by Shapeshift, with no account or sign-up required, it's the easiest way to buy and sell Counterparty, Gems, Swarm, Dogecoin, and other leading cryptocurrencies. Go to shapeshift.io and instantly convert your altcoins and to discover the future of cryptocurrency exchanges. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sébastien Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. Uh, we're here today with uh, Joseph Poon and Taj Dreija. And they, well, uh, Taj is the CTO of Mirror. Some of you may have heard of Mirror under his previous name called Warham. And uh, Joseph likes to hang out there as well. So uh, they're going to join us today to talk about Lightning Network. And I'm sure many of you have heard about Lightning Network. It's been coming up recently, more so because of the whole scalability uh, scalability debate, and it's a, it's a really interesting proposal to sort of take Bitcoin to the next level in terms of what it can handle with transactions. So uh, thanks for joining us today, guys. Yeah, thank you thanks. for inviting yep. us. Yeah, nice to be here. And thanks for coming on so late, by the way, because I know for our listeners, uh, you guys won't know this, but we actually tried to do this show earlier this week, and we had some technical issues, and uh, we got some sorted out, and... and um, and uh, they were nice enough to come back on again, but it is quite early here in Europe and quite late in California. So uh, thanks for uh, for taking the time to come on again. Sure, no problem. Yeah, no problem. So to get started, um, the scalability problem, right? I mean, most most listeners will be aware of this, right? But that Bitcoin is not actually currently able to handle all the economic transactions in the world. It's uh, <laughs> an understatement. <laughs> So uh, I, I saw, I, I mean, often that number that gets sort of thrown around is seven transactions per second. But then I think some people have actually looked at the transaction size and what's really possible. I know, um, what's his name? Uh, Organ of Cordy, I think, has done that, who has a, a blog on mining. Or, or, I did, or maybe it was Dave Hudson who has another blog on mining. Uh, and, and they've estimated it was like more three to four transactions per second. Yeah, which is right. obviously uh, not um, exactly Visa level, which I think you guys have mentioned in the paper can do up to like forty five thousand. Yeah, that's like their per su- that's their peak. Yeah, right. I mean, perhaps they could do even more. Right, that's what they're actually doing. Um, so yeah, I guess the issue is if if you wanted to scale Bitcoin, sort of the the way of you know just increasing the block size, then you get gigantic blocks. Uh, so that, that that doesn't really work, right? So, um, well, it's it's different, uh, you know, different use cases. You could have gigantic blocks, and like today's computers could probably deal with it. But there's a lot of other problems. But I I wouldn't, you know, I would I wouldn't say that it's technically infeasible. But it it's a very different network and a very different currency than if you have one megabyte blocks. So, so what got you guys uh, interested in this scalability topic? I think Bitcoin needs to work. And um, <laughs> fundamentally, the problem is, is that, right, there's a trade-off of, okay, we, let's just make bigger blocks. And if you make bigger blocks, then who's going to be able to solo mine? Who's going to be able to validate the full chain? Um, yeah. If it's only three or four people in the world that can validate a full chain, it starts looking like Visa. And at that point, you might as well just run Visa, right? It's a lot more efficient. Um, that's being a bit flippant about it, but I think there's a certain truth to that. Um, ideally, what you want is everyone ha- having the ability to validate the full node. I think the threat of maliciousness in you know um, trying to attack the blockchain becomes a lot more difficult when anyone can validate the full node. That's not to say that everyone will, but you know if you have a spare computer, you can prove that you know history has not been changed okay, that's interesting so you guys think that that should be the goal of bitcoin that it remains possible for someone on their home computer uh, to run a full node yeah that's really important especially with mining right um ideally in the future solo mining becomes more and more feasible um with more software being written and um 
mining is a is fairly centralized right now. I don't think it needs to be. Um, so I mean, long term, ideally, you want more and more of the miners solo mining, and in order to solo mine, you need to be able to validate the full blockchain locally. And how do you see solo mining becoming more prevalent in the future, given the current path of mining? I think you can make the payouts. Um, and a lot of the core devs are talking about this, um, where you make the payouts, um, you know, the 25 Bitcoin per block um, centralized. So you pay out to a particular address and, and you do the mining shares also notif notified to this pool, but you still generate the blocks locally. Um, something similar to, you know, Luke Jr.'s get block template, um, you run a full node, um, but all the share payouts go out to this pool, but the pool doesn't make the blocks, you make the blocks. But do you, do you think, what's the incentive here for these solo miners? Because, I mean, it's it, that would be possible today, right? There's P2P pool today and, and people aren't using it. Uh, I'm, why do you think that's going to change? I think, P2P, right? I think P2P pool is fair. The demands are fairly high for P2P pool. Um, P2P pool has certain scalability issues they can be mitigated um, I think the ideal solution is somewhere between P to pool and this is just my own opinion and this can change at any time but somewhere between P2 pool and pooled mining and uh, whereby you know you do generate the blocks locally but the payouts are centralized um, yeah and that's a proof that you have a share in them and stuff like that so um so uh, coming back to scalability topic, right? So one, one reason why this has become such a heated topic at the moment, and I was just at, in Prague uh, last week, and I gave a talk there at the, the conference about uh, exactly this topic, which is increasing the block size from currently one megabyte, which ends up limiting it to these three to four transactions per second to 20 megabytes. And uh, Gavin Dreesen made that uh, proposal and uh, there are some some people in favor of that, like Mike Hearn. And uh, then there are quite a few people against that. I mean, I, I read the, the whole Bitcoin Dev thread, and there's a lot of heated debates and a lot of anger at each other and uh, unfriendliness going on. This has but, been going uh, on for many years. I remember writing in like 2011 about this stuff, and same exact problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. So it, I'm I'm curious why do you guys think this is such a heated debate? I mean, uh, it, it seems like there's a lot of animosity uh, between some not, of these guys. It, I I think there are several problems. I think people don't understand that they have fundamental disagreements about the nature of what they're. So like to me, I I've talked to Gavin about it. I've talked to other people. Um, I think one of the big differences that people have in their minds is should blocks be full or should blocks never hit? You know, if you have a block size limit, should that limit be hit or should that limit be sort of like in IPv6 where you have, you know, two to the 128 IP addresses? You should never run out of IP addresses, right? That's sort of the goal of IPv6. Whereas in IPv4, you're we're out. Um, and so that, that's one question people should like get off, you know, get at the beginning. Should blocks be full? And there are many developers who think, yeah, blocks should be full. That's you're paying for space. That's how um, these transactions have, you know, mining fees. Um, and someone like Gavin and many other people think, no, block size is just a, you know, denial of service prevention measure, and blocks should never be full. Yeah, so, no, no, to I yeah. totally agree. I think that's that's one of the core issues that's being debated here, right? And then you have. Uh, but I, I think there's there's also a sort of a slightly different question, right? Which is one: is it desirable to have like full blocks in the long term, right? Because maybe that's necessary to pay for the security of the network. Because otherwise, nobody's going to pay for transactions, and miners won't make any money, and it will be really cheap to attack it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but then you have, and, and I think that's the the position that a lot of people hold, such as. Uh, who were the like Matt Corallo or uh, Vladimir Vanderland and many other of the core developers. And then I think you have sort of on the other side, right? Like Gavin and and Mike Kern and stuff. It's like, uh, even, you know, there's a problem like right now and nobody has a clue how such a free market would work or how that would, uh, how that would possibly work if blocks were full today, you know, you'd have a big problem. 
And so I think in a way, like whether or not it's desirable in the long run, I haven't seen anyone explain how it would work well in the short run if we actually ran into that problem. Yeah. Well, I, in the short run, Bitcoin's still going to work, right? Um, what's going to happen is people are just going to delegate their coins to some central party. Everyone's just going to dump all their coins onto Coinbase. Bitcoin's still going to work. It's just, you know, there's counterparty risk at that point. Well, but is that Bitcoin working? I mean, if you can only use it internally in Coinbase or if that that does not seem to be like oh it's not desirable working yeah yeah, yeah. Um, no. but um i mean i think there's an inevitability of that occurring if nothing is done yeah or the other threat would be some other coin or so i mean that's not something most bitcoin people worry about but this is you know to some extent of a, a very free market and bitcoin usage is purely voluntary and if other people come up with something that does scale better and doesn't have these fees, um, we can all switch. Yeah, absolutely. So what is your opinion? Should the block size be increased to 20 megabytes? I'll, I'll, my, I, it's kind of like the ultimate Keynesian beauty contest. I'll just do what everyone else is doing. So if a bunch of people want to do 20 meg, okay, I'll do that. <laughs> if no one, if no one uses 20 meg, I'll stay with one. So, so it, it, but if you had the power here to, you know, make a decision, or if you, if you both actually could have a, an influence which way it goes in this context, what do you think is better for Bitcoin? Oh, if, if, if it was like you could go back in time and change what Satoshi put in there? No, no, just like right now, if you could choose, like, you know, if you could, if you were the dictator of Bitcoin, and uh... <laughs> well, then why would you have Bitcoin? <laughs> yeah, no, I would, I would probably, if it were up to me, and like I could somehow magically make it bigger. Yeah, I'd make a bigger block. Why not? It gives you more runway, it gives you more time to work with this stuff before you have to actually deal with the problems. Because, because we're not, you know, I think that similar to what Mike Hearn was saying, like nothing else is ready yet. Um, whereas, if you just want to increase the block size, it's, it's fairly straightforward and you're pretty sure you know what's going to happen so yeah but i think you know even raising the block size we're not ready yet right let's say we, everyone agreed today to do it it might even take you know one year who knows right um six months one year i don't know but but that's that's one year because people disagree so much right it's not one year because it's complicated it's one year because no, I, I think it's one year to reach the consensus, I think, on the network. You don't want to, if you implement it tomorrow, right, let's say, let's say all the miners agree to make it 20 megabytes tomorrow. Um, your client, the Bitcoin client on your cell phone, you know, on your computer, won't work if you don't update. So Yeah, but you don't have a node on your cell phone, right? I mean, hard, very few people. So SPV would not querying, work? Yeah. It, it depends on the, the yeah, servers on you're the querying. Yeah. And in yeah. many cases, yeah. So, yeah, so it's yeah, mainly, yeah. you know, who's running a full node and who's not mining. Um, and if, if the non-mining full nodes also update, then yeah, there's no problem. But it, in practice, it's going to be a big mess. And, and you're very reluctant. If I'm a miner, you know, the first miner who's going to put this 1.2 megabyte block out, it's very risky for them. Is it really going to work? Um, and so they want to be very sure before they mine this, you know, slightly larger than one meg block, that all the nodes are going to be okay with it, all the other miners are going to build off of it, and that it's a safe thing to do. Uh, so I think it's very risky for the person, you know, for the people who take the first step. And even if even if they know, it may be the case that everyone's updated their software, everything's cool, and in practice, all the miners say, hey, we'll accept 20 megabyte blocks, but they just keep mining one megabyte. And no one wants to, you know, take that first jump. Once you take the first jump, it's like, yeah, it's easy. We can, it works. Yeah, but that, that seems like, I mean, okay, the risk is maybe you lose one block reward, but that's not such a crazy amount, right? So if you're a significant mining pool, it seems like well, that's it. Well, there's also a risk of, you know, maybe some exchange doesn't update and now, you know, there's some risk of them losing money. Um, that yeah. the risk is non-zero. Um, yeah, you really want to get everyone on board, so... But the, the way I've thought about this and that the way I sort of phrase it also in, in my talk is right. The, 
so there are obviously risks with both things, right? Like if you if you increase to 20 megabytes, well, some change in, you know, maybe it increases some attack vectors and stuff. And if you don't, then, well, you start having these new behaviors as well because it's not really clear what happens when the blocks are full and the mempools keep filling out more and more. And then, like, people try to compete by, like, pay more than the other person in fees and you have to wait to see if it really gets in or not. And so, I mean, I, I think if you sort of think of it, like what changes more in the network? Like what changes the behavior more? Like which scenario has more unknown factors? And it seems pretty clear to me that leaving the block size where it is actually will change more things. It will bring more risks and, and you will come up with these scenarios that we just have never seen in the Bitcoin network. Whereas if you increase this to 20 megawatts, it's pretty much like the way Bitcoin works today. I mean, maybe there is a little bit more of a difficulties running a full node and stuff, but it doesn't change that much. So just in terms of like riskiness, it seems pretty obvious to me that increasing the block size is a lot less risky than starting to have full blocks. Um, I mostly agree to play devil's advocate. I think the point of view of the people that don't want to have increasing the block size as the first solution. Um, take a view that um, creating this sort of fee market creates incentives for other systems to come about. And if you sort of have increased the block size as an immediate solution, um, there's a possibility that, you know, two years down the road, you just keep increasing the block size. Yeah. And eventually you reach a point where nobody can validate the chain. I think that's sort of their point of view. Um, I think there is some validity to that. Um, yeah, no, I, 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 do, I do agree that there's some validity, right? That maybe one needs to have the urgency that, oh, like Bitcoin's going to go to hell. Otherwise, uh, you know, if you don't do something... And because nobody can agree on increasing the block size, our only choice is to come up with some other solution. And you know, maybe yeah. that sort of pressure is actually necessary so people do so. Yeah. But also, I don't also know. If, if, um, if the 20 megabyte change goes through without you know, too many problems and it's not too painful, then people will say, well, we went from 1 to 20 uh, back in 2015 or 16 or whatever. And so we can go from 20 to 100. Uh, that'll, that'll happen. Right. I mean, if it, if it happened once, it'll probably happen again. Right. So so there may be that sort of assumption if it goes through. And that that is something that's maybe dangerous. Yeah. It's time for a word from our sponsor, Voltoro.com. So, you know, there's different ways that you can use Bitcoin. Some people use it as an investment and speculate on it. But if you're a Bitcoin business like us and you don't have a bank account, uh, you don't want to be exposed to that volatility risk. And, you know, there's different ways that you could protect yourself against that. Some people have bank accounts. We don't. We only uh, use Bitcoin with, uh, you know, our advertisers and suppliers. And we don't want to end up like the Bitcoin Foundation and lose all of our money when the price goes down. So we have to hedge. And to do that, we use Voltoro. So we at Epicenter Bitcoin, we hedge about 50% of our funds with Voltoro in gold. And it's super easy. You know, you deposit, it's there instantly. You can start trading from just one milligram. So, you know, there's no real barrier to entry. And the great thing is, right, you can really run a business. You can be protected from the volatility uh, and you can do it without having fiat currency and without even requiring a bank account. And then you don't even need to provide KYC if you deposit up to $5,000 worth of Bitcoins per day. So Voltoro makes it super easy, makes it super convenient and, and really gives you that option to be protected from the volatility and be a cryptocurrency business. Go to Voltoro.com and start trading today. We would like to thank Voltoro for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. The discussion has occurred before, you know, when there was a soft uh, limit uh, a couple of years ago, and they were that limit was increased from 250 megs to or 250 yeah. kilobytes. kilobytes to uh, to a meg. Um, couldn't there be some intermediate solution where, in order to test uh, where this would go and how the network would react, we would have you know, like increase the block size, but still have a, a soft limit and then perhaps gradually increase the block size uh, with that soft limit? I'm very much in favor of having a soft limit in this, for, it, not only for the reason that... Actually, what is exactly is a soft limit? So the it's idea of a soft <laughs> limit is, let's say, let's say you increase the limit to 20 megabytes. There's two, there's two kinds of soft limits that you can establish. Um, one soft limit is you yourself 
you set a limit of your block size if you want like, to uh, you as a miner yeah you as a miner set a limit of let's say one megabyte still so nothing changes for you on your blocks that you create it's still one megabytes even though everyone else accepts 20 megabytes um, a more aggressive soft limit um, would be one where the if another miner mines something greater than one megabyte above this soft limit you orphan out that block and you don't recognize it as a valid block um, okay. however yeah. all the other nodes still accept 20 megabyte blocks um, so right. there's sort but, of I mean, two of course, kinds of soft limits that can exist right but of course if the others accept those blocks then you don't really have any interest in orphaning it you know, yeah. unless uh, you're the majority, right? that, that, that would be suicidal. Right, but on the other hand, if all everyone else rejects a you know, three megabyte block, yeah, yeah. then no one else will mine on that three megabyte block. So, so it will basically be like minor, you know, the, the client is updated, the software is updated, now there's 20 megabyte blocks, but somehow this oligopoly of mining pools and miners say but we're only gonna do two megabytes and if it's sure. more than that but we'll... they can do that today they can exactly you know. right so i mean in a way it's yeah that's uh so it's not not something anyone can can rely on right, right. so my, sort of my point is that um let's say you make block sizes unlimited where any full node will accept a block of any size i think there is an inevitability that miners will just create some sort of limit and they will orphan out large blocks in order to maximize their Bitcoin fees. I think if you know you don't build some type of software for the miners, they're gonna write it themselves. They'll, they'll figure it out. They'll talk to you. they'll they'll say, hey, you know, it, the actual limit's 10 and we'll we'll get back, you know, we'll figure it out later. But you know, if someone just publishes a you know 10 gigabyte block no one's going to even be able to process that thing before the next block comes out. So they're just going to ignore it. So, so and I, I don't know if this has been proposed or not, but it, it, in terms of block size, uh, couldn't there be a, a block size that would vary based on some factors like network capacity, transaction I, I, volume? So, okay, I wrote thing. about this a while, uh, several times, and it's on some pages. Um, I think one way to do it is you come up with a magic number, which is the long-term mining reward. And you vary the hard block size based on the median um, block reward. So essentially, long-term, you know, the, the mining, the Coinbase reward goes to zero. How do the miners keep getting paid? Well, you just say, okay, one Bitcoin per block. And if the miners are getting more than one Bitcoin per block, that means the space is too scarce. So the blocks need to increase in maximum size. And if they're getting less than one Bitcoin per block, that means that there's too much space. And so the block but sizes need to go down. That, um, that you have some, some attack vectors here too, you know, because as a miner, of course, you could pay uh, a huge pay fee your to own yourself. Block right. Yeah, exactly. But that, what that would do would be to increase the block size. And right, generally, so you would, it seems like the miners yeah. want smaller blocks. So. I, I wrote about this a bit. I can link to it and stuff. And and it is to some extent gameable, but if you make it sort of like the median uh, fee over the last, you know, couple of weeks or whatever, like the same with difficulty adjustment, then you sort of need a, you know, majority of miners to collude in order to game this, uh, in which case you're already kind of screwed. So I, I mean, I think it's maybe the downside of this kind of plan. I think I like it. I came up with it. I think it's kind of nice long term. It's a little bit complex. And you have to come up with a ma come up with a magic number, and for that reason, it feels like it's probably not going to get implemented. <laughs> um, but it's I think it's a cool idea nonetheless. So I think something you know the the fewer lines of code you have to change, probably the easier it is to get in there. Today's magic word is channel, C H A N N E L. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. So uh, let's talk about Lightning Network. Can you guys give an introduction to what this, the idea of Lightning Network is? Yeah, so the general idea for the Lightning Network is to um, solve the problem of... Um, whereby Bitcoin scalability is such that you know you you 
the current assumption, well, the previous assumption was um, in order to, you know, have a large amount of transactions, just have big blocks. And um, it's sort of this silly idea because I sort of don't care what everyone else is doing, right? Um, if someone's buying a cup of coffee um, using Bitcoin, I don't really need to know about it, and the entire world doesn't need to know to know about it. The miners don't need to know about it. Um, you sort of Until, the only people that yeah. <laughs> should know about it is you know just the person in the coffee shop and maybe some people in between. So the way it works is using something called Bitcoin payment channels. Um, and um, Bitcoin payment channels allows two parties to establish a relationship using multi-sig. And it, um, but payment channels, you know, you can establish between you directly and your coffee shop, but that's sort of point to point. So you need to create one Bitcoin transaction for each person you're interacting with. Um, that also has some scalability concerns. So what the Lightning Network is creating um, a system where you can create a payment channel on a general network and by participating on this network you can send Bitcoin off chain to anyone and it never hits the blockchain until you close out the channel. Can, can you explain what a payment channel is and perhaps how it relates to how if payment channels exist in the yeah. existing financial network what, what they look like? Taj is better at explaining okay. these kinds uh, of things. So I think this all started with Bitcoin J, or I, I, I don't know how to attribute it the best, but uh, the basic way it gets started is with a multi, you know, multi-signature uh, addresses are required for payment channels. Um, and what you can do is basically, let's say I'm going, you know, I'm Alice, I'm going to pay Bob, um, but I don't know how much I'm going to pay him yet. So it... it might be 0.1 Bitcoin, it might be 0.2, it might be 0.3, I'm not sure yet. So what I will do is open a channel with him. And the way I open a channel is I get Bob's pub key and my pub key and put them together. And that's a multi-signature address that will be the channel address. Um, before I send, and let's say I'll do a maximum of one. So before I send the one Bitcoin into that channel address, I will ask Bob to sign a refund transaction. And let's say the refund is valid tomorrow. Uh, so 24 hours from now, using NLOCK time, Bob signs a refund, that full Bitcoin back to me, back to Alice. And since I have that refund transaction, I know that worst case scenario, as soon as I fund the, the channel, Bob disappears or, you know, is, becomes uncooperative. And the worst case scenario is, well, I just have to wait a day and then I get my Bitcoin back. Um, so knowing this, I say, okay, I'll put the one Bitcoin into the channel. And now that Bitcoin is to some extent, shared between me and Bob. And we both have to sign to move that Bitcoin for the, for the rest of the day. So what I can do is I can sign and say, hey, Bob, the, the spend that I'm going to make from this uh, multi-sig address is I get 0.9 and you get 0.1, signed by Alice, and then I send Bob the signature. And Bob can sign himself and push it to the network, but Bob can also just wait and just hold on to my signature. And because and, Bob knows he can sign himself whenever he wants before the end of the day and he'll get that 0.1 Bitcoin. So essentially the signature from Alice is as good as a payment. Um, it's as good as being confirmed on the blockchain as long as Bob posts it eventually. Uh, so Bob, can, so Alice can keep rewriting and Alice can say, okay, I'll, I'll give you 0.2 and back to 0.8 back to me, signed, send the signature, 0.3, 0.4. And Alice can keep incrementing the amount uh, she's sending Bob just by signing. And so, uh, you know, short, whatever, 80, 100 byte signature sent to Bob is the payment itself. So it's kind of neat. You can okay. ch chop things up. And fundamentally, it. yeah, fundamentally, it's doing net settlement on the Bitcoin blockchain where um, and without trust using real Bitcoin transactions. So payment channels are actual Bitcoin transactions that are just not broadcast on the blockchain yet. This isn't, I mean, people call, you know, like um, payment channels a sort of layer two network. Um, it is a layer two, but it is still fundamentally a real layer one transactions that are made, right? These are real Bitcoin transactions. You know, you're not handing your money off to some other party. Um, and, you know, the only thing you're doing is just deferring the current state of who owns what until later. Um, without trusting. Okay. And so now this is a, a, a channel between two people. 
All right, this is a fairly simple scenario. Now, what happens when you have you know, n parties? Uh, the whole bit, maybe maybe not the whole Bitcoin network, but let's say we have like four or five parties. How does that then work at that point? So the assumption, probably, yeah, the assumption Start topology would, initially, yeah. yeah. Um, the assumption would be that um, through somebody else, you can reach anybody else. So, you know, maybe it's Alice, Bob, Carol, and Dave. Alice has a relationship with Bob. Bob has a relationship with Carol. Carol has a relationship with Dave. Um, Alice can send money to Dave through Bob and Carol. Sort of uh, like the that, that starts sounding a little bit like Ripple. Is that, uh, are there similarities there? It's similar. Well, I would argue that it is similar to the way financial systems work, and Ripple is similar to the way financial systems work. Um, for example, in trading markets, and this is you know just, I mean, the inspiration for something like the Lightning Network is how financial systems work, right? So um, for equities, um, there's a principle of something called T plus three, the letter T. Um, so T plus three means that. Um, when you, you know, let's say buy a stock or sell a stock, it must be settled within three days. And it routes through, you know, your clearing, clearing, you know, clearing your broker, ultimately, you know, something like the DTCC. And in each step, there's some soft requirement to, you know, for example, your broker has to record some data um, overnight at, by the end of the business day. Um, and ultimately, all of this must be settled within three days. Um, and each hop, each step, has certain requirements on each, you know, on each day. Um, so, is it like Ripple? I would argue that this is all like how financial systems actually work. And Bitcoin is sort of replaying the history of money. Um, we're sort of at 1000 BC right now. But um, it's important to look at the way things are done um, because, you know, there's, there's probably a reason things are done um, a certain way in the financial system. And Bitcoin will be doing something similar, but in, you know, without requiring as much trust or any trust at all. So, so, so Bitcoin is a, a pre-medieval system and the Lightning Network takes it into the 21st century. Is that More years? like, you know, 100 like BC. <laughs> I'd say like Renaissance, maybe, but yeah. <laughs> so I, I was wondering. So there's, there's a lot of areas of this that still aren't very clear for me. It, does does it require running some sort of server architecture, or is it purely peer to peer? Like, what does the technical uh, back end of this look like? Yeah, in practice, you need some nodes who are on up up, you know, online all the time. To, to sort of be the people routing uh, these payments, right? Okay, and and anybody can act as a node. Um, yeah, I mean, on with any computer or any mobile phone, you can act as a node. Uh, the most mobile important phone, probably not a good idea. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the most important function of the system is you know you don't want to trust the nodes that you have channels open with. Um, so yes, ideally anyone can be a node. Right, but. I think uptime is an important part. If you're if you're intermittently online and people cannot reach you, you know, because essentially you you have no counterparty risk to the extent that your intermediate nodes can't steal your money, but they can go down. They can become unresponsive or uncooperative, and that does ruin the functionality of the payment channels. So so the real metric of you know trustworthiness or reputation is this guy's you know got five nines uptime. He's always there. Um, so probably phones are not a great thing, but if, if you have a home internet connection that works really well and you just have a laptop that can do these things, then you can be a node. Yeah, by going, if you do go down, then um, you know the counterparty doesn't lose their money, but it just might be locked up for a little bit. So you might want you know three or four channels open with different people just in case. So, so um, before we talked about in this, you know, uh, two people, a two party. A payment channel model, right? So I would pay it into this multi-sig address that's you know controlled by the both of us, and you know and that gives me the sort of security, and I can replace those transactions. So if now we have a network, who is that other party? I am, you know, I am signing. You know, I'm putting in the multi-sig. With. Is that the node? Uh, yeah. So you know, one of your you know channel counterparties. 
that you are connected to, yeah, you just you're updating the balances with them. And and then that node has uh, channels open with other nodes and those with other nodes and those with mm -hmm. other people, and then it gets kind of routed through everything. Yeah, sort of right. like the internet. Yeah. Okay. The 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 key is you're not. Um, so there are some proposals where the idea is you know the simplest case would be Alice, Bob, Carol, um, and Alice wants to pay Carol without establishing a new connection between Alice and Carol, though there is a connection Alice to Bob, Bob to Carol. Uh, so that's sort of the simplest topology you can think of where this this occurs. And some some are, you know, some designs are, well, you just pay Bob a really small amount, and then Bob will pay Carol a really small amount, and you sort of keep asking Carol, hey, did you get the point zero zero one? And then you keep, you know, incrementing that way. That that may work. Um, it's a little uglier. The the whole part of Lightning Network that makes it fairly complex, but kind of nice is Carol essentially comes up with a random number and keeps it secret and then distributes hashes of that number. Um, so that essentially you're paying Bob contingent on him paying Carol. So Bob only gets the money if he sends Carol money. So Bob is there's there's not really any trust involved. Uh, I don't I don't know if I, I want to that may be overstating it slightly. I don't know. Would you say that there's not any trust? I mean, there's kind of no trust involved, I guess you could say. Compared to the other model with, you know, Bob having, you know, you just give money to Bob and you assume Bob money will give money to Carol. Um, that works if Bob has a really good reputation. Um, not anyone can be Bob at that point. And furthermore, you know, you can't have a situation, well, it'd be much more difficult to have a situation where Alice pay Bob, Bob pays Carol, and Carol pays Dave. Um, you know, when you diffuse out the trust um, without using, you know, this hash lock construction, it becomes a lot more difficult to construct this without, you know, one of the parties stealing all your money. Yeah, the, the accountability and tracing who, you know, when something goes wrong, if there's 10 guys in the middle, it becomes a real mess. And he's like, well, it's his fault. No, it's his, her fault. And it, it, whereas with the, uh, the hash lock mechanism, it's very clear when something goes wrong and, you know, where the blame is. And also, you don't really worry as much about something going wrong because okay. it makes it more atomic. Yeah. So just briefly, if you do you start having a kind of a, a scalability or a cost problem here as well? Because there's so much data to send around that, you know, if you have to replace those transactions between different nodes or is that not a problem? The nice thing about it is, is that it becomes a point-to-point -point problem, right? If the load between Alice and Bob um, to Carol is very high, well, that's only localized between those three people. Um, it's sort of, you know, a, a, a very localized problem, whereas the Bitcoin problem starts looking like an N-squared type problem, where, you know, the more communication goes out, the more users involved, it sort of starts, like, increasing dramatically. Um, with this, you know, yeah, if Alice is sending a lot of money to Carol through Bob, there will be a lot of traffic, but they can handle it. They can reroute around it. It's much simpler. Yeah. With today's computers, I mean, you'd need to write really nice software and you might want to have like C and optimization stuff, but you could handle quite a lot, even with today's, you know, cheap computers. Today's show is brought to you by our friends at Shapeshift. Shapeshift is the fast and easy way to trade altcoins. And if you've been to their website lately, you've seen that they now support Gems, Swarm, Storage Coin, and Master Coin, which brings the total number of coins they support now up to 32. So you want to trade some altcoins? You want to use Exchange to do that? Do you still use a fax machine? Of course not. When you want to trade some altcoins, you go to Shapeshift.io and get it done in less than one minute with no account or sign up required. Okay, so, so here's how it works. You head over to Shapeshift.io. You choose the currency you want to sell and the currency you want to buy. Let's say you want to sell some of your Dogecoins because they're no longer cool. And you want to get some gems, which it just started supporting. So then they give you an address. You send the Dogecoins there and you give them your, uh, your gems address. And they put the Shapeshift conversion for you and put some directly into your wallet. Super easy, super smooth. And um, by the way, if you have a website, you need to check out their Shifty button. So the Shifty button, basically, you can put it on the website. And it allows people uh, to donate or pay to you in any altcoins, and you just receive Bitcoin. 
Uh, it's super smooth and we use that on our website so you can give us all your coins of all kinds of currencies and we just get Bitcoin and we don't have to worry about like having 27 different wallets on our phone and uh, laptops and have our whole bedrooms full of paper wallets because who'd want that? So uh, head over to shapeshift.io uh, and start trading small coins today and we would like to thank them for their support of Epicenter and Bitcoin. So with the Lightning Network, the, the blockchain then acts simply as a, a clearing network where transactions will, will get pushed to the blockchain um, to protect against dishonest actors? Um, I wouldn't even use the word clearing. It's sort of like, it's sort of like court, automated court. Okay. Where, okay. you know, 99%, 99.99999% of the time, every contract, you, you make a lot of contracts in day-to-day -day life. And... They don't ever go to court, right? Um, the Bitcoin blockchain is such that you know it's automatic adjudication, um, right. programmatic adjudication. So, so this is something we were talking about uh, before the show, Brian and I. And I was kind of thinking about this: uh, if if the blockchain acts as programmatic uh, uh, court, then if everybody's honest. It's sort of an interesting uh, idea to think that then in that case, that we wouldn't need the blockchain. Well, um, you want a the, relationship the, where honesty begets efficiency. <laughs> so I think this helps with that. But without the credible threat of, you know, this blockchain, um, people may not be as honest. Yeah, I mean, yes, of course, I, I, yeah. I think when Sebastian brought up the point, there was like, oh, so, well, but, you know, you can't get rid of the blockchain because then, you know, where's the threat, right? People could run off with your money and like, there's nothing you can do. But it's also an interesting sort of uh, thought experiment. Like, would there be something at one point, and, and maybe, maybe if you actually trust those nodes in the middle, that could be such a scenario that maybe, maybe you don't need that anymore and you can replace that it doesn't seem obvious to me and perhaps there's no way and, and you really do need the blockchain to remain there at all times and proof of work to in order to make this work there, there's all sorts of like you know even today there's lots of transactions that you know one person on coinbase pays someone else on coinbase and it's very efficient and very scalable because of that trust i think this is a nice you know nice optimization where you've got less trust needed to get also a, quite a bit of scalability. And and one thing I would say is like, I don't think either of us are saying this can be like a replacement for most on-chain transactions. For, for many things, it just doesn't help at all. Like if I want to buy a house, payment channels, Lightning Network, it's useless, right? When, if, you end, if you end up with a vastly different amount of money or Bitcoin than you started, well, the payment channel didn't really help you. So if you're buying a car, you're buying a house, major things like that um, doesn't help for, you know, international things like that, uh, you know, big companies doing mergers. I think it's really good for, you know, microtransactions. It's good for recurring things like, okay, well, I'm, I'll get some of my paycheck into this channel because I know I'm going to be just, this is my spending money for the next two weeks or something. I think it's so. It's why doesn't it work? Because because you want to have some trace of that on the blockchain. Is that uh, no? Because um, if you know, if you're buying a house, it's non-recurrent and it. Ah uh, yes. Okay. Uh, you know, you're you're just you're you're never going to get it back, <laughs> right? Okay. Let's say it costs you know ten thousand bitcoins to buy a house, and you send all of those, and that's it. There's no point in making a channel because there's nothing. Uh, you know where it's going, and and that's it. Yeah, and, and you know the amount beforehand, right? The interesting thing in the payment channel is that oh, you can set it up uh, some larger amount and then all those small payments become really efficient. But, you know, if, if the amount is the, the full channel amount, then, then it's kind of pointless, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah basically. Um, it, for large, and, uh, and even with this, um, when you have a setup with like Alice and Bob and Carol and stuff, if large deltas happen between when the, uh, channels get established and when they end, you will still have to have on-chain movement of coins. You know, if, if this whole entire section of the network only has five coins going through it and another like less connected section of the graph has a lot more, you will need on-chain tra on -chain transactions to move balances. Um, so it's, yeah. mm. it, it, it's helpful for scalable, you know, it helps with a lot of small things. Uh, I think it's great for buying coffee. 
Um, but so, so if, if you think of Bitcoin, you know, as currently like 3000 BC or whatever, um, this could be a nice, uh, you know, this, this doesn't replace like wire or ACH, like big block, uh, lightning network is sort of more credit card. Um, that's, that's a, you know, good way to replace it, I think. And so when, when transactions do get adjudicated on the blockchain, uh, when these payment channels get cleared and, and get pushed to the blockchain, we don't see any of the transactions that occurred with within that channel. So, I mean, I was thinking about this. It, it sort of changes the dynamic and some of the ideological principles of Bitcoin where you know, we have transparency, everybody sees all the transactions. What do you think about that? It, it doesn't hurt, right? <laughs> I mean, it's it to some people they think, oh, it's more anonymous, and it's not less anonymous. Um, it's a little different in that the the full visibility that the blockchain shows, you don't have that anymore. But if the intermediate nodes report to each other what's happening, well, then they still know what's going on and where your payments are going. Uh, so the information's still there. It's just not as evenly distributed as before. So mm. so does that. Yeah, so th will that make Bitcoin more anonymous or does that mean if somebody wants to uh, get information on, on the actors in the network, you would just run a bunch of Lightning Network nodes and you would end up getting most information? How, how does that play out? <sighs> yeah, I think in practice, it doesn't directly help anonymity that much. It could be used for that reason. Um, I don't know. What it? <laughs> that's a good question. It it could sort of go either way, right? What do you but think? But what about I'm like if you look at something like Electrum, right? So with Electrum, the anonymity is kind of interesting, right? Because you you trust the server, uh, at least with with the data, and the server knows everything about you, but um, or you know a lot about you. But then if you know if the server is doesn't tell anyone, then you are really anonymous. No, no, but, uh, but running a full node is purely better than Electrum, right? Electrum doesn't, right. you know, connecting to an Electrum node doesn't really mask you in any way that a full node wouldn't. But but it does if the Electrum node doesn't reveal any data, right? But your full node, you can just wipe the hard drive after you're done. Um, yeah, I, I, I know, right? But like most people can't run a full node, right? So assuming that, you know, the Electrum server is some sort of anonymizing thing, uh, you know, then you are actually stay anonymous. Right? Nah, I, 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 would, <laughs> I would hesitate to, I mean, I, I, one, I think it's really not that bad running full. I mean, okay, sir, I'm like this Linux nerd. And so for me, running a full node is no big deal. Um, but I don't think running full notes too bad. I mean, I think it still runs in Windows. Okay, Bitcoin QT stuff. But, um, right. Electrum but in, a way, in a way, in a way, so with, uh, with Electrum, right, you, like if you run the node yourself, it's like running a full node, right? Yeah. If you, if you run the server, huh? Elect running an Electrum full node is... It's yeah, like running good. a full node, right? So it's a running so a full node and then Electrum on top of that, which is a, yeah, it's right. But so the and the thing is, it, you know, if you ran that and you know you trust yourself because you know it's your data and you're the only one who controls it, well then it's like anonymous as if you're running a full node. And let's say that it's like your neighbor who's this like uh, uh, cypherpunk who's like you totally trust this guy. Well, as well then uh, you know you are pretty anonymous. So my question was more like, if you had payment channels operated by, you know, some parties that you really trust their integrity and that they value you in an anonymity, et cetera, would then this uh, allow you to be fairly anonymous with Bitcoin transactions? It, it's, it, that's, that's a similar question as if, you know, you had some, you know, Bitcoin custodian, similar to, you know, a coin, right, list, let's right. say, right? Yeah. Where you give them your coins and, you know, they can do micropayments. Um, I think nothing is stopping you from doing that today. Um, the only thing Lightning Network changes is, you know, the threat of, you know, um, of counterparty risk. It doesn't change the um, anonymity factor significantly, I believe. Yeah, although the, the threat of counterparty risk could lead to, you know, more the thing is you can't really trust them but if like you have some whatever lightning network node dot onion 
and oh, let's all use this one because it says it's going to keep our, maintain our anonymity. It might, and and it's less risky than using Coinbase Onion or they spell it wrong or something. Um, I, I don't know. I I think there are a lot of other really good. There's a lot of cool research into um, increasing anonymity in Bitcoin. Um, there's a lot of cool projects on how to do this um, that that people need to work on because I think anonymity is really important because it's such a safety critical thing that you know if I look on the blockchain right now and I see ooh here's an address with like five thousand coins I want to steal those coins I'm a bad guy um, I got nothing to go on it's just some hex string. I don't know how to steal that guy's coins or that girl. I have no idea who it belongs to. Um, and so anonymity is a really great safety mechanism in that case. Um, so I think, you know, I, I'm it's, for anonymity as much as anyone, but it's I also think important for like the businesses as well, where you, yeah, know, you need yeah. to understand, you know, someone wants to discover your supply chain. Someone wants to under understand what kind of sales volume you're doing. You know, if, if, you know, if things are fully transparent, oddly enough, um, businesses stop operating, you know, um, oddly enough, trade drops dramatically. Um, information asymmetry sometimes is good and functional, um, purely due to, you know, over, over, you know, overconfidence, but you know, that's how society works. Capitalism relies yeah. upon that. Yeah. So I think there's, yeah, but I mean, you, you don't really have that in, in Bitcoin if, you know, if you use different addresses, I mean, there's ways to protect yourself against there, your there's, competitors there's really good knowing, ways to I would say there's really good research on how to do this. Um, right now, there's not a lot implemented that's really good. Um, and I don't think Lightning Network directly helps with that aspect of, of Bitcoin. Um, so, but it doesn't to, hurt to, either. Yeah. Can we talk a bit about the, the, the fee structure? So how would those nodes be incentivized? Does that mean you would pay a, a little bit to, to sort of each node in between? Um, and, and would that, I mean, I presume that would be a lot cheaper than the fees you pay on the Bitcoin network. But, but how would that play out? I think what would happen is, you know, you, let's say, you know, Alice wants to pay Dave through Bob and Carol. Um, as part of the payment, Bob and Carol receive, most of the time will receive some very, very small amount that is paid inside this channel. Um, so it might be, you know, a couple Satoshis or whatever it is. Um, what's interesting is that um, perhaps the relationship between Bob and Carol, there is a lot of money moving in one direction. So if you are moving money in the other direction, you know, um, the fees can go negative. Um, there are situations where, you know, um, maybe Bob and Carol want to free up some funds. So by you sending money to Dave, they're willing to pay you. So, you know, it needs to be a signed integer, actually. Um, and, you know, maybe the relationship with Bob and Carol is only, you know, um, 0.1 Bitcoin. Um, but you have hundreds of Bitcoin moving through this, this you know, this channel. Um, and in order to do that, you have people constantly shuffling the money between um, Bob and Carol in the opposite direction while money flows in the other direction. Um, and I think um, the risk of channel intermediaries, um, you know, having funds stolen can be severely mitigated by having um, people intermittently online and willing to move, move funds between different parts of the network. Um, so, you know, core nodes that do a lot of traffic you know, oddly enough, can have very little Bitcoin um, purely by people, you know, um, you know, let's say your phone just comes online for five minutes and is willing to free up the channel for some very okay. small payment. So, so if, I had, uh, if I had channels open on, on different parts of mm -hmm. the network and if I was willing to always do these sort of other, uh, you know, tr transactions the other way in whatever mm -hmm. way uh, sort of goes against the, the main flows, I guess, to balance those. I could maybe make a little bit of money. Yeah, yeah. And, I, I, it won't be a lot, but, you know, it's not zero. Another hurt. another thing that could be very possible, I mean, it depends how these things end up working out. It could be that a, a lot of the hubs are companies that are known entities and, and look like, you know, financial companies today to some extent. And they, the information, you know, and this sort of ties into anonymity, the information may be valued enough valuable enough that they'll let it go through them for free. So somewhat like how, you know, Facebook or Google or Twitter or all these sites, they just, they just want your, your data. They want to see where these payments are being routed. 
and that data is valuable because they know, hey, everyone's buying this stuff now, or, or all these payments are going from this area to this area. Uh, so it, it may be that the cost to run the node is so small that the information gathered through doing so is enough to pay for it. That's actually just something interesting that came to mind here. I mean, it sounds a lot like with all this Bitcoin regulation coming that running one of these uh, nodes, you know, for perhaps it would be uh, providing a financial service and stuff. Have oh, you guys geez, thought about not. this at all? <laughs> I mean, arguably, this is mostly for micropayments and there is little to no custodial risk. Um, you know, that's that's as strong of an argument as you can make, right? Um, so, you know, um, is it possible that it falls that way? I think it's, you know, it's not zero, but... I hope not. You know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that would be very... I think something, a restriction like that would 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 inevitably impact Bitcoin itself. Because if, if having two multi-sig right. addresses open, it makes you a financial service or then something like so that. So will mining, yeah. right? I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess the only the only scenario when when that could be considered uh, providing financial service, I mean, the logical implications would have to be that also being a miner would be uh, running it. Right? Maybe, that, although in a miner, you don't necessarily know who these transactions right, you know, are. Presumably, you don't know which with the, yeah. Are. yeah, presumably you have some kind of communication channel open with the other p nodes that you're participating in the network with. But yeah. I hope not. Um, that would that would be a pretty unfortunate interpretation. Although one, the nice thing with Bitcoin is, you know, if one national jurisdiction or one place has certain regulations, well, people can sort of move to, you know, and nodes will operate in places that do not have those regulations. Yeah, totally. No, yeah, it would be easy to circumvent those uh, if if that actually does happen. Yeah, not even circumvent, but just you know. It will yeah, incentivize yeah. companies in places that don't have those rules. So let's address uh, some of the, I guess, criticisms to the Lightning Network. I mean, we were talking about uh, blockchain uh, block size increase earlier. Um, sort of Lightning Network has been proposed as a solution for uh, that transaction volume uh, issue and the issues that are that we're trying to address with increasing the block size. Uh, one of the criticisms is that this just won't be ready. Like it won't be ready because we need this now. Like we're going to be over capacity perhaps next year. Can you talk a bit about that? Oh, it's not going to be ready anytime soon. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if, you know, if we're going to hit the black, the block size cap and, you know, things might not be getting confirmed quickly um, in the next, let's say several months or, you know, within let's say three to six months, um, the the lightning stuff requires you know several soft works, um, at the, the most minimum important, one. Yeah, the uh, most important is you know, the malleability stuff, and without that, it just cannot work. So. Yeah, you need to you need to fix you know multi party malleability, and if you don't fix multi party malleability, this stuff doesn't work. I mean, it literally. Let's say you write all the code today, um, you know, like it won't work on Bitcoin today. Um, so, 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 but let, let's say now they're somehow the core developers all agreed, like, we're not going to do this. Uh, we're not going to do this block size increase, but we may be willing to do these forks for the, um, for the lightning network. I mean, I don't know which one of the, which scenario is more likely to get consensus well, on. There's, there's do, multiple do problems those... as well, whereby, okay, so let's say, you know, let's say the block size doesn't get increased. Well, you still need to make a channel to open up the channel, right? To open up. You need to make a transaction, transaction to open though, up the yeah, channel. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't a real Bitcoin it to transaction that hits the blockchain. Yeah. Um, and it's actually a so, little bit bigger. <laughs> yeah. So maybe it's like two to three, you know, transactions per second. Two to, two to three channels open per second that you can do. Um, and the other thing is the security model relies upon the ability to dramatically increase the number of transactions on the Bitcoin network for a short period of time. Um, in the paper, I think that it is proposed, you know, it's sort of proposed as a soft cap structure or, you know, a variable block size structure where, you know, miners can agree in some form to dramatically increase the block size for, let's say, one week. 
Um, that type of security model, you know, can't exist with a one megabyte block. So paradoxically, paradoxically, even though it sort of mitigates significant amounts of, you know, um, the scaling issues, in the sense that when there's more users, it doesn't dramatically increase um, the number of transactions. It also require seems to require um, somewhat bigger blocks. Because, because I mean, isn't there security risk here as well, right? So if you put money in this uh, in this channel, uh, I mean, you like you don't have to trust them because. As long as you can broadcast that refund transaction, giving it back to you at some point, get it in a block within you know, some your, determined your money. period of time. Yes. Right. So of course, if you start having full blocks and this crazy competition for higher fee, who gets in the block, then you know maybe that starts becoming a little bit uh, hazy, and you could be running the risk that you can't get it in the block in time. Well, right. So that yeah, has in, to be in a time is the key because if if that refund transaction, so in the the you know, earliest example of the payment channel, if um, both, let's say both parties put one Bitcoin into the channel and then they decide, you know, who owns which part of this, um, it may be that, okay, Alice pays Bob a lot. And so that's now Bob's money on his Bob's balance sheet. He says, yeah, I got, I got two Bitcoins from Alice. Um, if somehow Bob is not able to push, publish that transaction and Alice is able to instead get this refund, Alice has an in effect taken the money back. Um, so, so it, it does make these sort of race conditions very tricky if the blocks are all full and, and then one person's transaction gets in and not the others. Um, so you, you need, a, uh, some, some slack, some leeway in the blocks to put a lot of transactions because it can be really spiky. You know, the, the disaster scenarios, if there's one node in the middle that has, uh, you know, thousands of channels open and it somehow gets hacked or goes down and everyone wants to close the channels. Um, so you'd have a lot of things happening at once. So there, there's a lot of risks. The, and with one megabyte blocks, those risks are somewhat larger. Um, you kind of want, you know, um, some sort of structure with larger blocks. Um, but it can mitigate the increase. Um, but, you know, the security model weakens over time as more people use it with one megabyte blocks. Yeah, so, so basically... Uh, I mean, this may decrease uh, the demand or the necessity to put transactions in the blockchain, but it's only secure if you know if you don't run at capacity and you have full blocks all the time, because otherwise you start having all kinds of attack vectors and risks. And so you actually you, I guess that also means the Lightning Network may not be compatible with this idea of a fee market where there's a scarcity no, of it's, transactions. No, it's absolutely compatible. I, 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 um, what, it, what is necessary is a variable-sized block, which you know, some sort of structure determines it. Um, you, if you know, the miners agree that it's one megabyte today, the block size, there will be some you know, sort of fee market and if they later decide it to be 10 megabytes, you know, the fee market, you know, might be a little bit looser. Yeah, but you want the, the normal users to sort of accept the miners dictum in that case. You want the, because the miners are going to say, okay, something happened. There's a huge spike in transactions for all these channels closing. We want to be able to process this in order so that people don't get, you know, things stolen or misappropriated. Um, and you want the normal users to be able to recognize these suddenly larger blocks and then be able to go back to small blocks or something. So it, it's, it gets a little messy. <laughs> so the, the, way, the way I see this is it, it's been labeled and you guys sort of propose it as a solution to, um, to scalability, but I think that it's a solution to scalability as a consequence of the other things that it does. So I, I think it's really great for uh, opening up um, microtransactions, making those cheaper and, and more fluid and not having to wait for, like many confirmations, but we're not solving the scalability issue with this. It provides more scalability as a consequence of what it does, but uh, we still need some other solution fairly quickly. You, you need other solutions. It solves the issue long term, right? Where, you know, okay, what are we going to do? Block size to infinity, you know? Um, it's sort of, you know, sort of at the tail end mitigates the problems. Um, you know, instant, you know, you, you also have It's sort of a force multiplier. <laughs> you can maybe get 10x more out of 
you know, a one megabyte, you know, if you have a fixed size block, this can sort of help get a lot more out of that size, but it's, it's a linear multiplier at best, I think. Hmm. And, and let's say we do increase the block size and like the scalability issues get solved. And then, you know, the lightning network also becomes uh, prevalent. You know, some people may, may use it and others may still just use the blockchain. I mean, there would, there may be, I mean, of course there, there would absolutely be, uh, two types of users, those who use the Lightning Network. And also, I was mentioning this with Brian as well, is like we might get in... So let's say these payment channel networks, because there are others. We mentioned StrawPay earlier, and others may uh, prop up as well. There, there might be some scenario where some payment channel is only used by, I don't know, one geographic area because it serves a certain purpose there or a certain set of users or a certain set of applications because it specifically does one thing that's really good for that. So we might, in fact, get into this scenario where there are multiple payment networks built on top of the Bitcoin blockchain um, that aren't necessarily compatible with each other and it sort of compete for users and security uh, etc <laughs> on the one hand that's fine that's great free market on the other it'd be kind of a disappointment if there were two that were like functionally pretty much the same but were just incompatible for like silly reasons like oh this one's big indian this one's small indian and they just can't talk to each other that would be really frustrating um but if they have but that's pretty i, I think that's pretty likely to happen uh, if <laughs> if payment networks take off I hope that if, if it's fundamentally different, like these are different models and they do different things and there's a reason that they're incompatible, um, then then yeah, let's see which one works and great. But if it's just some silly thing where like, oh, this one is written in this language and this one needs this kind of parser and this is JSON and this is XML and like if that's the reason for the incompatibility, that would be really disappointing. Uh, so I, I, I hope that's not what happens. <laughs> so... Um... Before we wrap up, we're running uh, already pretty late, but uh, there's one concern I think that's quite important to address uh, that Mike Hearn brought up, uh, which is the idea that this Lightning Network could cause uh, centralization, especially of the wallet software, because it will be harder to write sort of secure Bitcoin software. And you know, today we still have people doing their like one man wallet operation without a big team of funding, etc and that that could become a lot harder. Do you guys agree that that's a real risk here? Um, so I agree with most of what Mike Hearn said in that blog post. Um, Mike, Hearn, Mike Hearn's a really smart guy. Um, I, I don't really agree with that in particular because I think, you know, writing something like this sure is fairly complicated but it is not more complicated than writing Bitcoin consensus code, right? Writing Bitcoin consensus code is extremely difficult and to the point where, you know, the core developers are sort of just discouraging you from doing it entirely. Um, yeah, it, and, it, and this would know, be open source. I mean, it's not like, I don't know. I don't. I mean, someone could make a, a closed source wallet just seems like who would run that, you know? Um, so, so, you know, if, if someone has implementation on GitHub of, of Lightning Network that's written in JavaScript or that's written in Haskell or whatever, uh, yeah, it might be trickier for someone to say, oh, I want to write it in C++ and do it that way. But, but there will be, like everything else in Bitcoin, there's going to be a lot of open source code and, and hopefully fairly friendly people to try to walk other people through it and get things compatible. Yeah, and, and of course, you may have uh, companies like Gem or Chain or things like that that then provide APIs and, and sort of modular architecture so people can, can do their own thing, at least uh, to some extent, and maybe mm -hmm. build on other people's services. Yeah, yeah. Cool, fantastic. Awesome. Well, um, what's the state of the development? Like, do you, where do you see this going in the next six months? Um, right now, it's sort of uncertain because we're waiting on how the malleability fix will be implemented in Bitcoin. Um, I think there's still some disagreements amongst the core developers. Um, that is a hard requirement for something like this working. Yeah, normalized um, versus no TXID. That's sort of a big question. Um, I'll probably have a newer version out of a uh, newer version of the paper out pretty soon, in the next couple days, hopefully, um, uh, presuming a 
what they were calling relative check lock time verify. I don't know what the current name is. Yeah, I don't like Maybe. that. Because <laughs> it's not op, time anymore. Yeah. <laughs> confirmations verify, something like that. I think they called it op maturity, uh, right? Someone's called maturity it Maturity verify, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. what I have it written on. I like that. So that that's an okay name. I like that. Yeah. But yeah, yeah that, that would verify, allow... Yeah. That would allow a bit. Uh, that would definitely help with ease of use, I think, uh, of the Lightning Network and other things. Yeah, it helps with explaining it in the paper because right now it's a little bit opaque. Uh, yeah, but it also helps because yeah. you can just continually renew the channels without without limit, really, yeah. if you have that yeah. opcode. So, so, so there's um, yeah. The main thing yeah. is is the the transaction malleability. You know, being able to reliably spend a transaction that is not yet on the blockchain is critical for like a lot of things especially this and how that how that becomes possible either you know have a sig hash type where you do not reference you know you don't sign your input txid or you sign a normalized txid instead um, and how exactly that normalized txid works and fits into the blockchain um, or the database i personally think like no txid is totally safe not totally safe but like safe enough that like just leave that in there. I mean, hey, if you have SIG hash none, you could have SIG hash no TXID like that. But other people think, no, it's kind of dangerous. People are going to write, you know, software and shoot themselves in the foot. And so, so that's sort of where it is right now, talking to them. And that's a whole different topic, I think. Yeah. Well, yeah, but, but <laughs> well, you it's... need to sort of get through that to get to this uh, Lightning Network stuff. But, but just, just uh, maybe uh, one last thing. So, what do you, what's the probability that that's going to get, that change gets through and what would be your sort of rough guess or estimate of when, by when that could happen? That's, so I think it's pretty obvious that pretty much all the core developers want that fix sooner or later. Yeah, just um, how to do it and, and the time, yeah. That. Uh, yeah, they might be taking their time. Um, it, might, it might be a while. Yeah. Um, and you know details of how to implement it. There's still disagreement on that. I think everyone we've talked to wants it, and they're like, "Yeah, we know we need to fix this, but how to do it in the safest way and the most scalable way, and things like that." So we, we okay, talk cool. That. Yeah. But guys, uh, thanks so much for joining us today and, and talking about this. I mean, it definitely sounds like a really interesting approach, and uh, I think it's, it's, it sounds really promising to sort of take Bitcoin. Uh, to you know, to a whole other level, and, and to really uh, get a lot more scalability out of this, and you know, make transactions cheaper. So I'm I'm really excited to see where this is going to go. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Us too. Um, ideally, you want to be able to do you know billions of people being able to buy coffee on Bitcoin, and not having it impact the network, you know, instantly, you know. Or even you know the yeah, the, the the Satoshi's paper talked a lot about. Did his paper? I don't know. Satoshi himself talked a lot about microtransactions. And when I first read it, I was like, great, microtransactions. But then pretty quick, you're like, wait, how does this, how does this do microtransactions? Uh, so it, it, I think it, to some extent, can sort of deliver on that initial promise that, yeah, you will be able to scale to, you know, less than one U.S. cent uh, based, uh, you know, value transfers. So you can Hopefully. use it to pay for internet, you know, Wi-Fi. You can use it to pay for a single article in the newspaper, you know, maybe, you know. It'll help, you know. See, Stuff that, like, the, you know, they've been talking industry. that for talking about that for 10, 20 years, and we still haven't gotten there, but this might help. So, cool, uh, fantastic. Well, um, thanks so much for joining us today, guys. Uh, we will have uh, we will have links in the show notes to the white paper, to the presentation, and to places where people can learn more about that. Yeah, uh, by the way, I just wanted to mention, so there was a great uh, talk that you guys gave at the San Francisco Bitcoin Dev um, conference in February. Uh, we'll link to that. Like if, so for listeners who want more of a technical explanation, they go in depth uh, in that talk there. So we'll have yeah. links to that in the show notes. We're giving well. a talk uh, next week in SF, if, the, if there are any SF listeners around, at um, 500 Startups. It's like downtown. So well, it depends the... on when this podcast gets published. Oh, then they might, yeah, it might have already sure. happened. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, well, we'll try to get it up before. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, thanks so much for joining us. And okay, yeah, thanks. thanks so much for, for listening to the podcast. Uh, it was a pleasure. So we release episodes of Epicenter of Bitcoin every Monday. So you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, uh, SoundCloud, or get it you know, on iOS or Android podcasting apps. Or you can watch a video on YouTube on our channel is uh, youtube.com slash epicenter btc and you know if you like the show you can always leave us a tip and uh, the tip address is in the show description so thanks so much and until next time